Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Nadia Ahmed, and I'll be moderating this session titled Feminism and Palestine, um, Why Our Liberation is Mutual, Collective and Intertwined. I have uh, three um, exceptional speakers uh, with me today to engage in this dialogue for 24 hours for Palestine. Uh, Farah Hadaibis is with us. She is a Palestinian Jordanian feminist activist working on the intersections between feminism uh, and broader social and ecological justice struggles. She's interested in feminist knowledge production and uh, solidarity building as ways to strengthen feminist movements across the region. Uh, we have Hayat Mershad, Executive Director of Female and Editor, Editor in Chief of the regional feminist media platform Sharika Walakin. She is a, a passionate feminist activist and journalist committed to cross border uh, movements building. We also have a pre recorded intervention from Rula Jibril. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be with us in the live session, but uh, Rula is uh, an award winning journalist, author, and foreign policy analyst renowned for her groundbreaking work in Europe, the United States, and across the Middle East. Uh, Rula's uh, diverse body of work uh, reflects her lifelong engagement with topics that have directly impacted her life, both professionally and uh, personally, such as the occupation of Palestine, the far-right nationalist movements rising uh, throughout uh, Europe and the United States. So we'll be having a video intervention from her. Welcome, ladies, and uh, thank you for joining the session. Uh, for 24 hours for Palestine. We'd like to thank the organizers for um, for coming up with this wonderful event. Um, Hayat, I'm going to start with you. As a feminist activist uh, committed to regional movement building, can you tell us why, in your opinion, uh, is Palestine, or rather occupation, uh, a feminist issue, and why do you think it should be at the forefront of uh, of our feminist agenda in the region? Good morning, uh, Nadia, Farah, and all. Uh, heck, I'm so glad to have this event happening and to be with you today. Um, well, uh, I will try, Heck, to summarize my question. But for me, at the beginning, I want to say that as feminists, we uh, obviously recognize that the principles of social justice and the human rights know no borders, uh, no exclusion and no discrimination. So when we want to speak about true gender justice, uh, we have to believe that it cannot thrive in a world dominated by violence and injustice uh, and where militarism and patriarchal systems intertwine uh, to perpetrate trade oppression. So uh, as feminists, it, it is crucial to acknowledge the interconnectedness of all struggles for justice and stand together in solidarity. Uh, for me, first, I think that Palestine uh, and the current militarized genocide that is happening in Gaza is not just a feminist issue. So it is a political issue. It is a reproductive justice issue. It is an economic issue, an environmental justice issue. It's also an ethical issue. Uh, and it is an issue that needs to concern our humanity at, at its core. So um, I think that at the beginning, to, to make uh, sense, it is crucial to start with the story from the beginning. So uh, the people of Palestine have survived and continuously resisted seven decades of occupation and violations of their basic rights. So their genocide has taken many forms, uh, occupation, displacement, assassination, sexual violence, etc. So the genocide we are witnessing did not start, uh, obviously, today. Uh, since decades, the ultimate goal of Israeli occupation and the Western powers that support this settler colonial and apartheid state is to render impossible the social and societal reproduction of Palestinians and eventually to lead them to their uh, physical death. So this is uh, one of the many faces of fascism and, and racist settler colonialist capitalism. Uh, and for me, feminism cannot support racism and supremacy and uh, this oppressive domi domination in any form. Um, another reason why for me Palestine is a feminist issue is uh, my deep belief in intersectionality, I identify as an intersectional uh, feminist. Uh, and for people who don't uh, know about the, the, the term intersectionality, intersectional feminism is briefly 
a framework that holds that women's overlapping or intersecting identities impact the way they experience uh, oppression and discrimination. So intersectionality rejects the idea that a woman's experience can be reduced to their gender only uh, and insists uh, that we look at the multiple factors uh, shaping her life, speaking about race, class, ethnicity, disability, uh, sexual orientation, as well as how uh, systems of oppression are connected. So when we look at the world uh, through an intersectional feminist lens, it becomes clear that Palestine is a feminist issue. Uh, Palestinian women face oppression and violence at the hands of, uh, of Zionism, um, and they are uh, impacted by this structural violence of Israeli apartheid. As I said, not from this day or during this genocide only, but for, for years and decades. So understanding this disproportionate impact uh, lies at the core of the understanding that Palestine is a feminist issue. Um, so for me, uh, it is a feminist responsibility to stand up and raise our voice for Palestine and for Gaza, uh, because today Palestinian women are living through horrors uh, that fundamentally challenge the core values uh, of feminism. Uh, under these circumstances, for me, silence is not a neutral stance at all. Uh, silence today is, um, in a way or another, a passive endorsement uh, of the ongoing tragedy or genocide. And this selective silence challenges, in, in a way or another, the universality of feminist solidarity. So, um, I think that silence at this time, especially from feminist actors or who identify as feminists, has become a form of complicity in a way or another. Um, uh, also, I want to mention that what Israel, Israel is committing in Palestine uh, now, I think, should be a wake-up call to all, not only feminists, but also the people in, in the global south and across the world. Uh, because what's happening in Palestine, and not only in Palestine, we can remember here Sudan and Congo and many other countries uh, in the global south, will determine in a way or, or another our common future um, and our, our, our fruits uh, 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 against anti-colonial struggles and our ultimate, if I can say, freedom from oppression and occupation and colonialism. So, yeah, this is in brief. Thank you. Agreed. Farah, um, you've written about uh, Israel using pink and greenwashing uh, um, to justify its occupation, co-opting feminist civil rights and environmentalist movements. Can you define pinkwashing as a term for uh, audiences that might not be familiar with it? And can you give us examples on how, um, how it's being used, how it's used as a tactic, and what uh, feminist and LGBTQ act activists uh, around the world, how they're responding to this. Of course. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I wish we were meeting in better circumstances, but um, I'm happy to be with you today. And thank you for inviting me. Um, Pinkwashing, for those who uh, are not familiar with the term, is um, a tactic that is used by um, corporations, states, uh, uh, usually uh, to beautify um, uh, uh, themselves, uh, claiming to stand with um, uh, queer liberation uh, uh, to divert attention from other oppressive uh, uh, practices that they do. Um, I think most of us have seen the picture of the Israeli soldier standing uh, on the ruins of a neighborhood in Gaza on day 37 of the genocide, holding the rainbow flag with the text uh, in the name of love written on it, which I think was the epitome of, of Israel's pinkwashing policy. Um, since the launch of uh, Project Brand Israel in 2005, uh, which was a PR campaign uh, to improve Israel's image globally, uh, Israel has actively and persisting, persistently um, used uh, pinkwashing as a way to justify its oppression of Palestinians and paint, paint itself as a, as a haven for queer uh, folk. Um, the narrative that Israel attempts to spread is that Palestinian society is oppressive towards uh, the LGBTQI plus community, uh, and therefore Palestinian society deserves punishment. 
and the members of the Palestinian queer community need Israel to save them from their fellow Palestinians. Countless Palestinian groups have uh, uh, articulated through their activism why they refuse and condemn uh, this in instrumentalization of their struggle to serve an apartheid system. Uh, they have highlighted the fact that queer Palestinians are subjected to Israel's militarized uh, violence, just like any other Palestinian. Uh, and they highlighted how they do not need a savior, especially not one that oppresses them due to every other uh, uh, aspect of their identity. Uh, after this picture of the uh, soldier in Gaza went viral, um, Lebanese composer and writer and performer Hamid Sino uh, explained in a video uh, on social media how these pink washing tactics also hinder the advancement of queer liberation in the region. Um, because such practices link queerness in the minds of Arab societies with imperialist endeavors, making it seem like queer liberation is a liberal Western quest uh, and that the mere existence of queer individuals in our region is an act of conforming to oppressive and brutal colonial practice. Uh, in a move that I would uh, that reminded me a bit of the conceptualization of womenism by black feminists in the U.S. in the in the 80s, who felt unrepresented by liberal white feminist movements at the time, uh, Hamid later published uh, on his Instagram account an alternative queer flag. Um, the flag, uh, which has now been seen in protests across the world, uh, represented queer liberation, as well as the interconnectedness of decolonial practice, anti-racist uh, uh, practice, feminism, disability justice, and class struggle uh, that are facing queer uh, people across the region and across the global south. Um, the refusal uh, to, to accept Israel's pinkwashing tactics was perfectly uh, articulated in a statement by uh, Palestinian queer, uh, by the Palestinian queer community, which was signed by over 300 queer groups uh, globally in October 2023. The statement said, and I'll quote here, we refuse the instrumentalization of our queerness, our bodies and the violence we face as queer people to demonize and dehumanize our communities, especially in service of imperial and genocidal acts. We refuse that Palestinian sexualities and Palestinian attitudes towards diverse sexualities become parameters for assigning humanity to an any colonized society. We deserve life because we are human, with the multitude of our imperfections, and not because of our, of our proximity to colonial modes of liberal humanity. We fight the interconnected uh, systems of oppression, including patriarchy and capitalism, and our dreams of autonomy, community, and liberation are inherently tied to our desire for self-determination. No queer liberation can be achieved with settler colonization and no queer solidarity can be fostered if it stands blind to the racialized capitalist, fascist and imperial structures that dominate us. And I'll stop here. That's amazing. Um, uh, there's also, other than pinkwashing, there's greenwashing, which is uh, which is co-opting environmentalists, presenting themselves as, um, you know, their projects as environmentalist projects. There's some very famous examples of these. Can you as well, Farah, um, define greenwashing this time and how it's used and how is this connected to a feminist struggle? Yes. Um, well, as you said, greenwashing is basically the same as pinkwashing using uh, the environmental movement and green practices uh, uh, um, to divert attention from other oppressive things that uh, certain corporations or uh, uh, states are doing. Um, Palestinian ecofeminists and environmental activists have been highlighting how the military occupation of Palestinian land is having severe negative impacts on the ecological well-being of Palestine and Palestinians for decades. Um, they have shown the many, many ways in which Israel has deliberately and systematically threatened Palestinians' food security, damaged indigenous plants and animal populations, uh, polluted water, soil and air uh, in uh, uh, the occupied Palestinian uh, uh, land. 
Israel, for instance, has uh, planted over 250 million trees in Palestine, most of them invasive pines and eucalyptuses that threaten the ecosystem to cover the ruins of Palestinian villages that were violently ethnically cleansed during the first Nakba. Uh, but they frame this, the planting of these trees as a righteous quest to green the desert. Um, Israel has also destroyed 57% uh, uh, of uh, agricultural land in Gaza since the beginning of the genocide, although I uh, I assume this number is, is probably higher, uh, and has uprooted and burned millions of olive trees for decades. Uh, it has also weaponized water since uh, 1967, when it declared that all water resources in Palestine uh, uh, should be or will be under its military control. These practices all aim to twist the arm uh, of Palestinians into submission, as well as make the Palestinian territories increasingly uninhabitable for Palestinians to further advance uh, Israel's goal of ethnically cleansing Palestine, while at the same time, time trying to brand uh, itself as an ecologically conscious uh, country. Um, Israel, Israel's military occupation, uh, of course, also threatens uh, climate justice globally. Um, militarization is one of the biggest root causes of the climate crisis. Um, despite that, militaries across the world are not yet obliged by any international climate agreement to report on their emissions or reduce them. Arms production, weapons testing, uh, maintaining maintaining the readiness of, of armies and uh, uh, all military operations are uh, ecologically destructive. Uh, Israel's arm production uh, uh, industry was worth 12 billion in, in 2022. And Israel is the second in the world in terms of uh, its military spending per capita. Um, and that's all before the war. Uh, the, emis the emissions of the first 20, 120 days of the genocide uh, on Gaza alone exceeded the annual emissions of 26 countries uh, uh, in the world. Um, at the same time, Israel attempts to greenwash wash its military practices by boasting about having the most vegan army in the world, referring to the number of vegan uh, soldiers among its ranks and the vegan boots and wool-free berets that they wear. Um, one uh, IOF soldier once said in a, a radio interview, in a very illustrative example of how dystopian this greenwashing tactic is, uh, the soldier said that her vegan diet is so important to her that had the army not been able to provide conditions that had harmed no living creatures, she might, might not have enlisted in the combat unit. I think all of this uh, uh, resulted in, in ecological justice movements globally uh, taking a strong stance with, with Palestine. And just to link all of this to with feminism, I want to highlight that um, ecofeminisms uh, recognize how the patterns of oppression uh, and exploitation of women and uh, of the environment are very simple, uh, are very similar, sorry. Uh, Ecofeminist analysis looks at uh, how oppressive systems, mainly patriarchy, capitalism, and colonialism, intersect to shape the unjust realities of women, especially women in the global south, and the destruction of the environment. So only through dismantling these systems will we be able to build a world where both gender and ecological justice are achieved. Again, beautiful way to highlight how our liberation is intertwined and collective. Um, Hayat, um, as editor in chief of uh, of Sharika Walakin, um, uh, a feminist platform that's been covering numbers, been covering facts, been covering the genocide for a while. Um, it's obvious that you know war in general and this genocide in particular um, takes a disproportionate toll on women and girls. Can you tell me, give me some facts and figures, and how and why this aggression in particular? is completely disproportionate, um, you know, the toll is dis disproportionate on women and girls. Yes, uh, so unfortunately, since uh, the beginning of, of Israeli, Israeli aggression and, and the war on Gaza, uh, our platform uh, became a form of a daily documentation tool of all forms of 
water. Uh, we've been dealing with, uh, unfortunately, with the news like mothers burying their <laughs> children with bare hands, families grieving for their lost homes and shattered lives under a rain of bombs. Um, but before speaking about the gendered impact in a way or another of the genocide, allow me, Nadia, to uh, first say to uh, to celebrate uh, the people and the women of um, of Gaza uh, in the face of uh, of such overwhelming violence. Palestinian women are courageously facing these unprecedented challenges. Uh, uh, they they are working to keep their community together in the face of such horrors. They are doctors, nurses, uh, and other medical workers who are saving lives uh, every day and providing comfort uh, uh, to the dying in Gaza Strip. Uh, they are also the teachers who are. Uh, 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 insisting on providing lessons and uh, uh, playtime for Palestinian children in shelters. Uh, these children uh, uh, whose lives will never be the same after, after this if they even survive. Uh, also, the women who are working as journalists, particularly since international media cannot get into Gaza, uh, are diligently reporting and documenting the violence against and the strength also uh, of their people. Um, I think that the names of these Palestinian women won't be celebrated in international forums or uh, uttered by political uh, leaders, but... Uh, uh, their steadfast refusal to submit to the uh, aggression of the Israeli forces inspires all uh, uh, those who fight for freedom and justice across the world, including us, I think. So um, uh, I think that it is important to mention them uh, in these platforms. Um, uh, now back to the uh, documented facts about the impact of the Israeli genocidal uh, assault on Palestinian women which is beyond catastrophic. I, I will be stating some, some quick uh, uh, figures. Um, and I think that, as Farah said, these figures represent only um, a few, uh, uh, if I can say, facts of what's going on on ground. So according to the facts, more than 9,000 Palestinian women have been killed by Israeli attacks only in the first six months of the war and thousands more uh, are injured or missing under the rubble. Uh, an estimated 63 women have been killed each day since the war in Gaza began last October. Uh, this is according to UN statistics. Uh, data shows that women uh, there are disproportionately impacted by airstrikes, health tolls, and displacement crises. Um, because women in Gaza are living in constant movement, constant fear, being constantly chased. Uh, there are no safe places uh, to be uh, a woman in Gaza. There's no safe places for any anyone, uh, but to women in particular, uh, nine out of 10 people living in Gaza are displaced now. Nearly one million women and girls have been displaced five and seven times at least, moving to areas that are increasingly smaller and where they are targets of attacks and bombing. Uh, they move with no cash, with no possessions, with no clue how and where and if they are going to, to survive or live even after. Um, also, forced displacement and overcrowding in, uh, uh, in particularly Rafah governorate is further compounded by the insufficient uh, availability of decent sh shelter solutions. Uh, this is resulting in surging waves of people having no other option than to set up tents and camps. Uh, almost uh, according to a survey by an international organization, 37% of women who were surveyed are currently living in tents on the streets and in empty areas. Uh, also, another 31% are displaced in overcrowded UNRWA schools. Uh, and it is very obvious to say that displacement increased the risks in terms of privacy, dignity, and personal safety. About 94% also of the surveyed women reported that they do not have any privacy, they don't feel safe in their uh, respective places of displacement. Also, I, uh, I need to mention, and this is one of the um, maybe uh, the main issues that uh, we've been speaking about uh, uh, recently, is that how war uh, left women without access to medical care. 
uh, including mainly pregnant women forced to give birth without basic supplies like pain relief. Uh, many women with chronic diseases also have been forced to significantly reduce the number of times per day they take their prescribed mas uh, medications so that they would uh, last for, for a longer time. Uh, this raises serious concerns in terms of health risks and complications. Um, also, UN experts have raised the alarm uh, at documented cases of Palestinian women and girls and girls being arbitrarily um, executed in Gaza, uh, often together with with other family members. Um, the, you know, even after the uh, the war on on Gaza, Israel has escalated its campaign of uh, arbitrary detention. Uh, imprisoning hundreds of Palestinian women across the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, several documents and the proofs has reported how women in Israeli detention are being subjected to torture, uh, including beatings, isolation, and also sexual violence. And this is something, unfortunately, that didn't grab the attention of the international and feminist community worldwide. Um, also, Palestinian women's reproductive health is endangered uh, by uh, these um, apartheid conditions in Gaza. Uh, reports from UN Women and UNFPA estimate that nearly half a, will, uh, half a million uh, of women and girls uh, have been uh, displaced. One in four uh, of these women uh, are of reproductive age. Uh, around 50,000 are pregnant and thousands are expected to deliver soon uh, uh, or have already delivered during these months. So, and also here we need to highlight the destruction of the hospitals and the limited availability of healthcare supplies, which means that women are uh, giving birth or experiencing miscarriages without proper care, as I mentioned before. Uh, for uh, for some, the stress of living conditions and constant violence are also um, wreaking havoc on their hormones and on their on their cycles. For others, as I said, the lack of privacy, water, or menstrual pro products is pushing them to uh, medically delay their menstrual cycle to avoid it uh, altogether. Um, and um, and here I want to mention that while feminism recognizes that reproductive justice cannot exist uh, uh, without access to reproductive health care. Women and girls in Gaza are uh, resorting to the use of, um, uh, if I can say, desperate coping, uh, coping mechanisms, including uh, using improvised sanitary clothes or sponges as, as sanitary pads to compensate for, in a way or another, for the lack of menstrual items. And we all know that this will have uh, very negative, negative um, consequences, not only on women's dignity, but also it will lead to significant health risks, so including uh, reproductive and uh, urinary tract infections. So, um, and one of the reports say that also we need 10 million disposable menstrual pads each month in order to cover the need of and the um, uh, the need for for the women in Gaza and Gaza Strip. Um, also, I want to mention briefly uh, the issue of food security, uh, which is worsening day after day. Uh, nine in ten women in Gaza uh, said that it is uh, harder for them to access food compared to men. And also a UN survey uh, found that 76% of pregnant women uh, are suffering from anemia uh, and 99% are struggling to access nutritional supplements. So. I think in brief, Nadia, uh, and this is one of the quotes for an UN uh, official, uh, the war in Gaza is a form of a war on women. And uh, this is a fact that the international and the feminist community has to deal with. Yeah, I mean, about food insecurity, not only is aid not going through, women who are delivering babies are unable even to produce sufficient milk, so they're unable to feed their child. Either way, the amount, the toll that it's taking on their bodies, on their mental health, they're unable to even anemic. And so, of course, it is a it is a war on women uh, and on children. Farah, you've worked on the topic of uh, foreign and development um, uh, policy, foreign fe feminist foreign policy and development policy uh, and interventions, um, specifically looking at how it's not all that feminist. Can you tell us um, what you've found and, uh, and uh, how it applies to the context of Palestine? Um, 
well, I'll, I'll start with some points on develop, development policy in general uh, and how it has impacted feminist movements and um, agendas, uh, feminist movements, but also broader uh, social justice movements uh, and agendas in the past decades. Um, since the, the 1980s uh, and following the global shift towards uh, neoliberal uh, development models, uh, global agendas that uh, uh, relate to women's rights and liberation uh, were beginning to change, slowly becoming more depoliticized and uh, increasingly NGOized. Um, the slowly uh, uh, um, made uh, uh, the the narratives of these uh, uh, and the narrative and work of of these movements. Uh, uh, more devoid of comprehensive analysis and critique of, of prevailing power dynamics and uh, made uh, uh, social movements uh, more broadly too focused on, on uh, the symptoms of oppression rather than the root causes and in increasingly entangled them in, in project-based work and bureaucratic processes. Um, in the context of Palestine, uh, the politicization of, of the, the process of depoliticization of uh, uh, feminist agendas is very clear when you look at how uh, the UN World Conferences of Women uh, used to have space for political analysis and slowly narrowed their focus on uh, equality between women and men. Uh, in the first UN uh, Women Conference on, on Women in, in 1975 in Mexico, uh, the occupation of Palestine was uh, uh, prominently discussed. Uh, the conference's report um, and under the section of Palestinian and Arab women uh, reaffirmed, and I quote here, um, the futility of speaking about equality of human beings at a time when millions of human beings are suffering under the yoke of colonialism. The, the, the report stated that international cooperation and peace require national independence and liberation, the elimination of colonialism, neocolonialism, fascism, Zionism, apartheid, and foreign occupation. In the reports of the Second World Com Con in the report of the Second World Conference on Women, Palestine was only mentioned by the Palestinian uh, delegation. And in the third uh, and fourth uh, conferences, uh, uh, the reports uh, didn't mention uh, the occupation of Palestine at all. The outcomes of these uh, conferences uh, generally lay the foundation of, uh, for the formulation of international gender-related uh, development aid and, and funding agendas in general. Uh, today, these agendas still uh, mostly ignore the role of both capitalism and neoliberal policy and colonialism or white supremacy as main causes of, of women's oppression across the global south. So when uh, Western countries like Sweden, France, Canada and Germany uh, uh, started uh, implementing feminist foreign and development policies, feminists from uh, the global south and from our region were a bit hesitant to, to take this as a completely positive development, and, and rightfully so. Um, they feared that these policies are yet another mechanism to depoliticize and co-opt feminist movements in the global south, uh, specifically through diluting the meaning of feminism to only encompass gender mainstreaming, equal representation and equal rights between women and men. While all of these benefit women in one way or another, they definitely do not encompass the feminist struggle. And while resources uh, are channeled because of these uh, feminist foreign and development policies to promote gender equality and support feminist activists and, and women's rights defenders across the global south, Looking at uh, uh, foreign policies, uh, uh, the foreign policies of these countries more holistically, uh, you see how the benefits of these feminist policies are dwarfed by the harm caused by those countries, especially the harm against uh, poor women, indigenous women, women in war and conflict countries, and so on. Uh, the clearest examples, uh, example on this uh, is the fact that Western countries with a feminist foreign policy are all export massive amounts of arms to fuel wars where women and girls are killed and raped and maimed and starved, all for profit, of course. Many other questions are, are being uh, uh, posed by uh, within feminist movements in the region when it comes to these policies. Um, 
are feminist and development, uh, feminist foreign and development policies recreating uh, neo-colonial dynamics between the global south and the global north? Uh, will they ever enable uh, countries in the north to overcome traditional foreign uh, policies and international relations? And how far uh, can these policies, uh, even the most progressive ones, like Germany's feminist development policy, uh, foster or support uh, radical feminist approaches in addressing uh, the root causes of, of injustice? The October 7th events happened and many of these questions were answered. All of these countries that claimed to center feminist principles in their foreign development policies showed how these policies are dropped at the earliest inconvenience or as soon as it threatened their, their interest. Um, Germany and Sweden, for example, halted their funding to Palestinian civil society organization, uh, a move that can only be described as collective punishment. Um, uh, they stopped funding under the pretext of investigating whether or not their funds are going to Hamas. Um, Germany, for instance, which uh, only launched its feminist development policy a few months before the war, uh, even vetted partner NGOs in, in Palestine and other countries that receive funding to ensure that they don't support the BDS movement. Um, then, of course, there was a the very successful attempt by, by Israel to stop funding to, to UNRWA uh, in the middle of the ongoing genocide, which uh, all of its allies, including those uh, who have a feminist foreign policy, uh, did without question. Uh, it was not until it was revealed that Israel's, Israel actually has zero evidence of its claim that seven UNRWA employees, although this is not reason enough anyway, uh, any, that seven uh, UNRWA employees were involved in the uh, October 7th attacks that uh, the funding was slowly returning. All of this is directly, uh, directly contradicts what feminist foreign and development policies should stand for. If you claim to be feminist, you cannot stop funding to partner organizations and feminist groups as collective punishment. You also absolutely cannot stop funding to an agency that provides life-saving supports to millions of women and girls in the middle of an ongoing genocide because of an accusation by those committing the genocide. And here I would uh, like to uh, end with reading a short uh, text from a statement that 37 Palestinian uh, civil society organizations published on October 17th in response. And my apologies that I'm, I'm using too many statements, but I think that, uh, you know, the words That's of those should have, have, yeah, more weight than mine. Um, the statement says that uh, donor pro pronouncements to halt grants and earmarked aid in, uh, to Palestine and the mere preoccupation with this matter while the genocidal horrors continue in the Gaza Strip proves that the international aid system is yet another tool in the toolbox of colonial hegemony in our region, a bludgeon used to bring the Palestinians to their knees. The discourse of development and aid is nothing more than political subordination that aims to subject us, discourage our struggle, and fragment its social foundation. These organizations that published uh, and signed the statement declared uh, their intent to continue to do the work without uh, uh, their work without relying on aid that uh, you know hinders their capacity in, in forging radical change towards freedom and justice of of all Palestinians. And I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Farah. That's um, incredibly valuable. Uh, and so it's obvious how far foreign uh, feminist policy is actually not feminist at all. The, um, the, they're not loyal to, to feminist principles. In fact, only neo-colonial and capitalist interests. I've asked Rula to tell us her thoughts about um, uh, about the West, uh, about how the West is responding, about how attitudes are changing or shifting, uh, and of course to give us some insights on the recent landmark ICJ uh, ruling. Rula has been raising her voice all over uh, Europe uh, and the US about Palestine. Um, she's very active in Italy. She speaks, she's fluent in Italian. Uh, she's been on multiple media, uh, major media platforms uh, uh, speaking about the genocide. So I thought it would be important to hear what she had to say. 
the ICJ, just a bit of a background, uh, the International uh, uh, Court of Justice just made a landmark ruling after 75 years declaring the occupation illegal, uh, the occupation of the West Bank, of Gaza, and of uh, East Jerusalem uh, as uh, an apartheid, uh, as an occupation, uh, defining it as illegal and uh, demanding that uh, all settlements cease development uh, all settlers be evacuated from Palestinian territories. Uh, this is a ruling that is historic. Um, I don't know if, uh, I doubt if Israel is going to be, since it is not binding, um, if Israel is going to be um, uh, applying uh, or or uh, essentially uh, respecting international law um, uh, despite this decision. However, it does come with considerations that all member states of the UN should be applying, are responsible to uh, to apply sanctions uh, and prevent uh, the development of um, uh, of any further settlements on Palestinian territory. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, what's about to happen, particularly considering that uh, tensions are rising, especially um, that Yemen now is actually adhering to international law with the way that they are responding uh, to the aggression in Gaza. If I can ask the operator to play the video from Rula Jibril um, so we can listen to what she had to say. Good morning. Since October 7th, since Israel waged a war in Gaza, we could see across Europe and across the United States the main divide, a polarized society between the overwhelming majority of the citizens and the ruling class, governments, the opposition. And you can see two different views of the world. One that is a humanist one, that believe we're all born equal, that international law applies to everybody equally, impartially, whether you're Palestinian or Ukrainian. And you could see, actually, the naked hypocrisy of the elite in the West, especially in the United States, in Germany, in France, in Italy. And you could see that they are still stuck, stuck in a vision of the Middle East, in a vision of the world that is deeply colonial, deeply settler, and deeply racist. And nothing exemplified that than the words issued by Secretary Blinken when he said, oh, the difference between us, meaning the United States and Europeans, and Russia is that we respect international law. Well, we've seen that actually international law is, has been used as a weapon to silence people or to be used as a weapon against the opposition or against countries like China and Russia, but does not really apply to the protection of civilians. And you couldn't see this clearly in Gaza. If Russia bombs hospitals and schools, and civilian infrastructure, it's immediately condemned and sanctioned versus Israel when it's doing the same exact thing. Many of these countries led by the United States actually continue to provide weapons. In these last nine months of genocide in Gaza, with a mass murder of Palestinian, mass starvation, mass destruction, the West has been signaling to the rest of the global South that your life doesn't matter that sooner or later you all be Palestinians. We can kill you at any time, and we can use the weaponry and the technology to eradicate you, to erase you, and impose our will. Something really extraordinary happened yesterday with the ruling of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. It's the highest court in the world. It's the United Nations, which actually certified for the first time that Israel has been criminally, illegally, illegitimately occupying Palestinian land in the West Bank, in Gaza, in East Jerusalem, everywhere. And they need to, to give back those lands. Those lands are not Israel land. And the laws and the rules that have been put in place are exactly like apartheid South Africa. 30 years after the, the end of apartheid South Africa, you have the highest court in the world giving us for the first time the tools 
the legal tools that we can use everywhere to hold to account not only Israelis, but also Western governments that need to comply with that ruling. Meaning, if you sell weapons, then you are complicit in the genocide of the Palestinians. If you don't sanction Israel, you're complicit with ethnic cleansing, the military occupation, the annexation of Palestinian lands. I've been covering and living in Europe and the United States for the last 30 years. And I can tell you that nothing exposed more than Gaza and the question of Palestine, this issue of naked hypocrisy, that the laws that been put in place after World War II to protect everybody, not only to be used to absolve allies and to be used as a weapon against enemies and foes. I just want to remind everybody that Iraq violated UN resolution twice and was bombed to oblivion. Well, Israel violated and continue to violate criminally international law, international rule-based international order every day on daily basis and brag about it. The Prime Minister Netanyahu will be in Washington next week. He will be received by Congress. They will give him a standing ovation. He will brag about his criminality and his ethno-religious project of exclusion and purity of extermination and expulsion. This is a moment we need to speak up for Palestinians everywhere, not only in Gaza, in the West Bank, and in Jerusalem, for the hundreds of thousands of civilians who are being butchered as we speak, for the weaponization, not only of famine, of starvation, but diseases. I just want to remind everybody that what Israelis are doing, they told us in words and deeds, what they will be doing from day one. I remember Giora, General Gior Eliad, who actually published an article in an Israeli paper called Ahodot Aharonot. And in that article said we, that Israel must use disease and famine to exterminate Palestinians and achieve their military aim. Achieving the military aim meaning expelling and ethnically cleansing Palestinians. What's happening in Gaza will not stay in Gaza, will come across the Middle East. It will be implemented in the West Bank as well, in the occupied territories. It will be implemented against Palestinians inside Israel, the millions of them, and especially with the parliament and with the Knesset, the Israeli parliament decided that there will be never a two-state solution. That means they decided that the whole Palestine between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea will be considered and treated as Israeli territories to conquer, to ethnically cleanse Palestinian from, and to basically grab, to steal. They will not stop at Palestine. Lebanon is next. I believe they want to wage a war on Lebanese because Lebanon is on the border they, they are eager to implement and carry the plan of the greater Israel. And you can see in Netanyahu's speeches, in many speeches of many ministers, that they are looking also at pieces from Syria, from Lebanon, from Egypt, and from other areas. We will be seeing a regional war sooner or later. And our region have to decide what side of history do they need to stand on? I know in my heart that many people stand with the Palestinians, stand with the human rights, stand with the legality, stand with humanity against barbarism, against this killing machine, against the camps of extermination for Palestinians. Because at heart, it's not about one against another. It's not about, it's about all of us. All of us can be safe together. None of us safe and none of us free until we are all free. And I believe truly that we need to start creating a large coalition to stand up to the hypocrisy of the West, to ally ourselves also with a lot of activists in the West, a lot of feminists, a lot of minorities who really feel in their heart, this will come back to hunt all of them because some of these policies will be brought back to the United States and Europe and will be implemented against minorities, against Muslims, against the black people and against many of the communities and especially women and young people who've been very vocal about human rights and about women's rights and about all of our rights and all of our freedoms. I thank you very much for listening. 
So that was Rula. Um, I'd like to thank Rula for her uh, intervention. Um, Hayat, I want to go to you after what Farah had said about foreign uh, feminist foreign policy um, and also about, you know, um, covering feminist news post October 7th. Um, how have your um, uh, editorial policies changed post October 7th? And as director of uh, a feminist NGO, a female, um, how has your relationship with donors been informed by what has happened since October 7th? <clears throat> yeah, so um, for Sharika Walakin as a, a regional feminist platform, we adopt a feminist editorial policy since our establishment in 2012. So as such, Palestine was at the core of uh, our media and knowledge production work. Uh, but the difference is that now we are uh, following day by day what's happening and playing, uh, trying to play a role in documenting Israeli aggression and standing in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, uh, we are playing also a role in linking our feminist discourse and beliefs to different issues related to the war on Gaza, like, for example, the right of people, of Palestinian people to resistance through the production of uh, a multimedia content that speaks to um, all types of audience, mainly women and girls. Um, as for female, as a feminist collective, and since we work mainly on movement building and we believe in, in solidarity as a main value, uh, we are trying uh, at the current time as much as we can to work on cross-regional actions. Uh, we contributed to uh, some global feminist strikes uh, um, uh, to ask for ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, we also contributed to uh, demonstrations mainly in, on ground in Lebanon. Um, and it's obvious uh, that our advocacy and reporting issues became increasingly uh, at odds or were, but we weren't aware about it, with many European donors who are um, mostly staying silent on, uh, on, uh, on the attacks on civilians in Gaza, which is supposedly, as um, uh, Rola mentioned, a violation of the international law, which they've been pre preaching about for, for years. So uh, our relation with the international community and donors I think is not and will never be the same after the genocide. Uh, we became more aware of these double standards and complicity. Um, I can say that the amount of anger and bitterness we are feeling is beyond expression. Uh, we really don't know uh, or um, uh, how or if we can interact with some of these Western governments or partners ever again. Uh, as Farah said, we witnessed how Western donors are cutting uh, Arab feminist groups off financially for uh, criticizing Israelis' atrocities in Gaza, a form of collective punishment, as, uh, as Farah said. Um, uh, and also we are witnessing how Western countries and foundations failed to vote for ceasefire or take action against genocide and how they're supporting Israelis' bombardment and siege of Gaza um, and how they were complicit uh, with our own land occupation and our own people killing. Um, also, the, uh, during the past uh, months, we, we lost faith in uh, many UN institutions and systems uh, which either have not spoken out against Israeli uh, aggression uh, or have only done so after considerable delay, uh, despite mounting evidence that such actions may amount to war crimes, and they amounted to war crimes. Um, uh, for example, after 50 days uh, of Israeli aggression and violence, uh, um, and where the world was expecting justice or at the very least permanent ceasefire, um, instead, you and women uh, chose to justify the aggression and to be complicit with the genocide. So um, it was like in a shocking display of, uh, of hypocrisy. You and women not only denied Palestinians the right to resist 75 years of apartheid imposed by a fascist colonizer, but they also chose to justify the murder of thousands of civilians uh, in an inflammatory and baseless statement. So um, uh, as um, as a response to this, uh, uh, we, we issued a, a kind of a press release uh, where we said that uh, we will cut any relation with UN women, including accepting any, uh, any funding. And for us, this position was not restricted and will not be restricted to UN women, but it will apply to other Western uh, donors who don't allow with our feminist beliefs and the position from the Israeli occupation uh, uh, because for us now it is time for the movement to uh, stand against the brutality perpetuated by 
UN agencies and Western uh, Western donors and governments, governments who have failed, as as Rola said, the humanity uh, with their uh, shameful stance on um, on what's happening in Gaza. And this is part, after all, uh, of our commitment to justice, equality, um, and um, hate refusal of uh, all forms of oppression, including uh, occupation. You know. I want to ask a, a last question to Farah. Um, the, the colonizer obviously twists our arm by, you know, controlling resources and not giving us access to resources. Feminist movements need resources. They are now, you know, especially with the stands that we're supposed to be taking if we're, uh, you know, committed to feminist principles, we're at a loss for, for resources. Uh, Farah, you, you had mentioned a couple of case studies, a Palestinian feminist movement called Talat, for example, and maybe some other uh, examples. Can you tell us in this political environment, um, how are feminist movements supposed to organize and mobilize effectively in this uh, in this uh, uh, post October seventh? Um, I actually think that Hayat gave many many uh, examples uh, uh, on how they've been navigating. Um, yeah, the challenging current political landscape in, in terms of uh, um, finding the resources and mobilizing. So maybe I'll not go so much into the uh, uh, example, given also that we don't have so much time. But in general, I think what what will enable us to, to organize and mobilize effectively is committing ourselves and in, in everything uh, uh, we do to our core principles and convictions to create uh, uh, movements that look and operate like the world we 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 aspire to 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 create i think this uh, uh, encourages people to to join movements uh, um i think it's also important to to yeah center feminist principles like like uh, care uh, care for each others uh, for each other to practice uh, meaningful solidarity to dismantle hierarchies uh, to call out hypocrisy and injustice and to and most importantly to to resist and um, resist attempts to to soften our discourse and dilute our demands resist efforts to fragment us resist uh, our subordination our humiliation our silencing um, and resist normalizing injustice. Uh, and in this case, it's the, the horrors that we are seeing unfold in, in Gaza. Um, I'll, Do you I'll have speak. hope? Do you have hope, Hayat and Farah? In the, last question. I mean, in, the middle, in the middle of all the horrible, horrible things that, that Palestinians are enduring right now, it's, it could be difficult to find hope. But um, although the price we are paying is very, very high, I think it has never been clearer why Palestinian liberation has to become a reality. Uh, I see hope in people, those standing up to, to uh, for justice, uh, unapologetic, unwavering, steadfast. Uh, I think as long as we're alive, there is hope. And as long as we stand together, there is hope. Yeah, nothing to add. Uh, the hope is in people and in the feminist movement, yeah. Thank you to, uh, to Farah, to Hayat, and to uh, Rula for her intervention. Uh, thank you for joining our session, Feminism and Palestine. I'm going to hand it over to the next moderator, Mohammed Hamdan, for their session, Palestine Censored. Thank you all so much, and bye-bye.